Good afternoon. I'm Jim Rosenbaum from Northwestern University, and it's a great pleasure to be here. It's a lovely campus despite the weather, and uh, uh, it's, the, the people who've organized this conference have done a great job, with one minor exception, uh, and it's related to the talk I'm about to give. Uh, they give, gave out a wonderful map for finding my way from the Shattuck Hotel to here, and it was marked very clearly, and I had a good sense of what that was going to take to get here. And then I forgot that maps, maps are flat. <laughs> and Berkeley is not flat. And I'm from Chicago, and Chicago is flat. We fit the map nicely, but Berkeley does not. Um, and the surprise of that is a bit of the kind of experience that students who are first generation face when they come to college. And we've done a lot of talking, and actually I was thrilled with the discussion this morning about community colleges, because they're a whole different reality. They are a reality that we don't understand. And I, when I say we, I mean me too. I, ugh, I've got a microphone here. Um, we, we know the system we went through, and my guess is all of you have a BA degree and nearly all of you went through a four-year college, and we know how that works, and so of course we know what college is, but that's not exactly what college is for community colleges, and in fact there's some really big differences that we've discovered as we've studied it. And so while we wear these BA, what I call BA blinders, we need to see beyond that if we're going to start thinking about what is higher education as an entire entity because it's, it's different things. Um, one of the big factors that we've talked about is the way the labor market has changed and changed its education demands. And we talked about the need for more people to have BA degrees, and that's absolutely true, and more people to have master's degrees and doctorates. But the other degrees that we don't know much about, they're also needed. And increasingly, the standard middle skill job, the mid skill job of the labor market requires an associate degree, often in an occupational field, or a one-year certificate even. And one of the neat things we found is those sub-baccalaureate credentials have actually taken on increased value over time. They didn't used to be valuable, and they used to be dead end, and they're not either, neither of those anymore. One, but the, to get a sense of how much the world has changed, and it literally has changed enormously, most students today as seniors plan to get a college degree. And indeed, 90% of high school graduates go to college. Think about that. Think about your high school class. 90% of those people now go to college. About half of them go to community college. This is an amazing transformation. Our society has really opened up opportunity. This was one of the goals of much of reform, and, and in some ways we've almost got it. We've got college for all. We've got everybody going. Of course, the downside, everybody knows. The downside is many of these people don't get degrees. On, on these national data, if we, let, if we can follow these people for eight years, we find about 20% get a BA degree. Another, uh, another batch get sub-BA degrees, uh, uh, certificates or associate degrees, that gets us all the way up to about 54% at community colleges. So 54% of community college students get some credential of value, at m m many of these of value, up. and it's 46% that get nothing. They go to college and they get nothing, and there's no payoff for that. So our question, is can ch colleges change their procedures so that more students benefit from college and get good jobs? And our research, research has discovered college procedures that may work for these students and may lead to good jobs. So first I want to broaden the question. The usual question is, do students get their money's worth? And that's one of the questions posed by this conference. And I would broaden the question to say, do they get their time's worth? Do they get payoffs for the amount of time they put in college? And that question is related to another question that turns out to be really fundamental. 
and doesn't sound like it's terribly, uh, terribly difficult to answer, but is. How long does it take to get a four-year BA? Well, it's not in the, it's not in the definition because it's uh, very few, less than half of students get their BA in four years. Um, another 25% uh, take over five years. That's at four-year colleges. If they go to community colleges, only 31% get a BA in four years. 25% take over six years. How would you like to break the news that your uh, four-year BA is going to take six years? That's, that's a lot of time and demoralizing. So I want to broaden our question beyond earnings payoff also. Sandy Baum, uh, who's about to speak, has shown in some other work, because I, I don't think she's going to be speaking on this today, um, that non-monetary outcomes are important, that there's more than just earnings that's an outcome for college. And extending that work, uh, my daughter, Janet Rosenbaum, showed that although college students often focus on earnings, by age 30, they will value non-monetary job rewards even more. Jobs that offer autonomy and career relevance are more strongly so, uh, correlated with job satisfaction than earnings is. Students need to know more about those job rewards, which, are, which they're going to value in the future, but they don't know about now. The other thing that Janet found was that certificates and associate degrees are valuable credentials. She finds that these sub-BA credentials are not only quicker, but they also have good job rewards, both earnings payoffs and non-monetary payoffs. Most important, students' goal should be career advancement at this stage. They should be thinking about jobs that have career potential. And she finds that sub-baccalaureate credentials have this, and they have it nearly as much as BA degrees, well, associate degrees have it almost as much as BAs. Certificates have it a little less, but still they have substantial. So st when students are looking for a job that has a future, for a job that where they, they're going to be doing something important, where they'll have responsibility and autonomy and discretion, these jobs from with just a one-year certificate have those attributes. So we need to look beyond just BA degrees, and we look, need to look beyond uh, earnings. There's another topic that's come up in this discussion, so I'm ad-libbing this one. Um, it, it, the Trump voters. The Trump voters, it, it is said, are the non-college white males who say they have no opportunity today, and they think their kids are going to have no opportunity. It's not that they don't know about college, but they think college is not for them. They think they can't make it in college. And here, I'm afraid we are contributing to that ignorance. We are contributing to that by saying, everybody must have college level academic skills to succeed in college. It's not true. But it's not true for, it is true for BA degrees. If, you need to, if you're gonna get a BA degree, you need to have high academic skills. Uh, there's a strong correlation for an associate degree or a one-year certificate. Academic skills do not correlate with success at sub-baccalaureate credentials. Not only that, they don't correlate with earnings of people who get sub-baccalaureate credentials. In other words, even low-achieving students can get those credentials at equal, equal odds to students of middle or above average academic achievement, and they can get just as good earnings. What does it require? Well, we interviewed faculty in these occupational programs for these degrees, and they said students need to have good, solid eighth grade academic skills. Well, our system could do that. We, we, our high school system does lousy at college level skills, but they turn out eighth grade skills pretty consistently. So there really are some opportunities here but nobody knows it. And we really haven't done a good job of letting people know that community colleges have these programs that don't require high academic skills and that a whole lot more people could do, but they don't know about it. So there are a bunch of things that we need to be saying to people about their opportunities. The next part is where I want to talk, get back to this map problem of what's not shown on the map, because um, just like we don't show elevation on a flat map, we don't show a lot of things about college, just new college students, and that turns out to be a really big problem. And so 
we found in our research that college procedures can shape the difficult areas. There's sort of three transitions with college. One is, one is getting into college, the other is getting through college, and the third is getting out of college and getting a good career. Each of these presents big problems, especially to first generation students, but college procedures can shape these in ways to make them more, more likely to happen. And so we, we need to question what we, what we think college needs to be, because a lot of our, our traditional college procedures work terrifically well with people whose parents have gone to college, but they don't work very well with first generation students. And we need to think about what's an alternate way to do college. And we discovered a number of different uh, procedures that colleges do that helps with this. Um, uh, and indeed, uh, we'll, here we're going to be talking about occupational colleges, which are private colleges, some, prof, non, uh, some nonprofit, some for-profit, which organized procedures really to, to better serve the disadvantaged students that they often take, and that actually sometimes work. Uh, and I'm not, I, I don't want to get sidetracked onto the, the for-profit piece because there is a wide variation of kinds of colleges in that sector, and we've looked really only at the better ones. In addition, we've looked at two community colleges that have used some of the ideas that, that from my earlier research, and I, I was thrilled to discover that it actually could work and that uh, some interesting ways that it was adapted. Um, so first, the first obstacle is college entry, as I said, and when students enter college, they face a big gap but in terms of what colleges require versus what they have. And uh, we found that colleges can devise alignment procedures that can make that problem much less severe. And one of the, one of the most interesting ways is uh, to give the college remedial test to 11th grade students. And by doing that, students immediately know what they're going to be needing to learn and what they know and what they need to know. And so that's, that's sort of a procedure that can be done. And uh, Cal State, uh, I believe, has pioneered and has done some pioneering work at this. The uh, state of Florida has also done that. Uh, another thing, though, is to s tell students who have low academic achievement that there are college programs for them. And, that you don't have to start off with remedial. Remedial is terribly demoralizing. It gives no credits. It is a hopeful program, but unfortunately, the evidence doesn't support it. It does not do a particularly good job of fixing the remedial needs, and so it becomes mostly an obstacle. And so for students with low academic skills, they, might, they, they need to be informed about uh, certificates, for instance, which don't require high academic skills. Uh, furthermore, we could be advising students in what I call an incremental success strategy. Instead of shooting for the BA straight away, shoot for a certificate or an associate degree on the way. Doing that means they're more likely to have some success in the process and they still have the opportunity to go on. And many, many students do go on from a certificate to get a uh, BA. Um, in the progress through college, there are a lot of obstacles. The most important are institutional obstacles that we create, unclear prerequisites, prerequisites not offered when needed, over-enrolled required courses, chaotic course times, changing course times every semester, and course time conflicts with work and family obligations. These are not students' fault, yet we blame students when they fail. We can, we can redesign colleges to make those less necessary. Um, in the uh, in, in addition, uh, there are ways of doing what I call uh, guardrails, and uh, that involves uh, monitoring students' progress and giving them good advice. Uh, the third transition, entering careers, uh, we, can, we can help students decide on their careers right at the outset with a career course, and, and both of the colleges I talked about have done that, and, and the, it helps students figure out why are they in college and what can college do for them and what kind of options they have. Having them make decisions about careers on their own uh, without any of this information, it's just uninformed choices, and they, they, it doesn't work very well. So uh, in other words, we really have to look beyond just money. Time delays are costly and demoralizing and harmful to completion. 
Second, good jobs are not just high pay. We need to inform students about non-monetary job rewards that they can't learn from their parents uh, because their parents haven't, uh, if their parents haven't been to college. And third, we need to redesign colleges to in use some of these procedures that um, allow students to reduce time delays, help them recognize what's a good job, and improve their college completion and payoffs. Thank you.